In his piece entitled Boys, Rick Moody does an exemplary job of detailing the changes in a set of brothers over the course of time. He masterfully paces the piece out, putting the right word here and stressing the right syllable there, all to create a beautiful written eulogy of the innocence of boyhood. There are numerous examples from which to pull in the text that show how Moody paces out his piece so well, but I am going to focus on three of the strongest examples. These three are his use of elementary, vulgar, and mono and small polysyllabic words early on to emphasize their boyishness, the switch to a darker and slower tone on the second page that helps subtly create an air of confusion and struggle that is present during any boy's teenage years, and lastly, Moody's rapid-fire final three sentences that, as their father lay dying, spells out the rapid realization that their innocence and their boyhood is gone. The larger purpose of this piece for me is a sort of reflection from outside on my own personal experiences, and so the importance of deciphering and breaking down all the elements that make this piece so powerful matters a lot to me. Early on in his story, Moody uses elementary depictions, vulgarity, and limited syllable words to create a kind of clipped, quick-paced tone that is reminiscent of what boyhood often looks like from the outside. For instance, Moody's line, not long after which boys dig a hole in the backyard and bury their younger sister's dolls two feet down, so that she will never find these dolls, and these dolls will rot in hell. The fact that the sentence is relatively long and contains no words with more than two syllables is a large portion of the reason the tone and pace is created as it is, because the sentence comes early in the piece, representing the shift from infancy to adolescence for the boys. Just as well, the vulgarity Moody uses is an important component of the piece as it emphasizes just how strongly the boys revere their father, a common trait in young boys, with Moody writing, boys trailing after their father like he is the second goddamn coming of Christ, goddamn almighty, which is a unique statement when one reads the whole piece and notices that profanity is by and large completely omitted, save for a select few instances. This is, in my opinion, an interesting contrast, how Moody writes about boyhood, and he also managed to write about it without using almost any profanity, even when boys are known for profanity. This entire opening segment helps set a strong tone for the rest of the piece. Moody makes the tone a much darker one as he begins to discuss the teenage years of the boys. He mentions how boys, standing just up the street, sneak cigarettes behind a window in the Ellis' yard. Boys call each other retard, homo, geek, and later, necklace thug, theater fag, and enter the house exchanging further epithets. This remarkably harsh shift from earlier in the story, from the boyhood antics to the use of powerful, stigmatized words and character attacks, is indicative of the changes that the boys are going through. From young and innocent to older and callous, this powerful change is further exacerbated by Moody's discussion of the boys' masturbation habits, saying, Desire like a madness upon them at the mere sound of certain words, and as they enter the house they feel, as always, immense shame at the scale of this self-abusive cogitation. This strong analysis of personal anguish and shame is a marked shift from the previous passages where Moody does not do such deep and insightful character analysis. Further, this change in tone is, I believe, a larger metaphor for the development of the boys, following them as they shift from wholly innocent to misbehaved to mature. Moody ends his story with a rapid-fire final three sentences that really hammer in the reality of the changes that the boys have gone through. The passage goes, Boys enter the house, carrying their father, slumped. Happens so fast. Boys rush into the house, leading EMTs to the couch in the living room where the body lies. Boys enter the house, boys enter the house, boys enter the house. Boys hold open the threshold, awesome threshold, that has welcomed them when they haven't even been able to welcome themselves. That threshold which welcomed them when they had to be taken in. Here is its tarnished knocker. Here is its euphonious bell. Here's where die boys had to sand die the door down because it would never hang right in the frame. Here are the scuff marks from when the boys were on the wrong side of the door demanding. Here's where there were once milk bottles for the milkman. Here's where the newspaper always landed. Here's the mail slot. Here's the light on the front step, illuminated. Here's where the boys are standing, as that beloved man is carrying out. Boys, no longer boys, exit. A striking and fast-paced recollection of all those things that the boys saw as the gateway to home, followed by the boys finally departing as men, is a breathtaking way to finalize a whole life's worth of growth. The power of the quickness in this portion is that it's reading as if the boys' entire lives are flashing before their eyes. This really helps bring the boys' growth into men into perspective. Rick Moody does a master job with his piece entitled Boys. The story is engaging, the pacing is phenomenal, and the idea of the piece is so relatable for so many people. When Moody opens the piece using short and elementary language to establish the boys as young children, he really shows his magic at drawing the reader into feeling as if they are living the story. When he goes on to shift the mood and tone to a darker one, 
He displays his mastery at commanding the story and emphasizing how the boys are really starting to grow. And finally, when he fires off his three rapid-fire heavyweight sentences to finish it all off, he shows his ability to both finish a story and really put on display how far the boys have come. This is a remarkable example of excellent literature with limitless examples to pick apart and expose.